Hello, this is Brad Jones of the CinemaSnob.com and YouTube.com slash Stone Gremlin Productions. And first, of course, I would love to thank the great Steve Gutenberg for his time and granting us this interview about his work. Plus, a special thanks to Mike Phelan of FanBolt.com for setting all of this up. First and foremost, one thing that I love watching about you is how really interactive you are with your fans and the people who really, really love your work. Even just today, I saw you uh, talking with someone who got their own um, one-in-the-oven shirt that Mahoney wears in Police Academy. And at first, it made me even wonder, uh, do, you still, do you still have a one-in-the-oven shirt from Police Academy? I actually still have the original one-in-the-oven which uh, I think is just a tremendous collector's item. I think one of these days, probably toward the end of the road, I'm going to have a big sale at Christie's. I've got some great stuff, so uh, you're going to have to wait about 40 years. But <laughs> 40? No, maybe 50. I think I'm going to 110. <laughs> I grew up watching your movies when I was a kid from Police Academy to Short Circuit. One reason why you and a lot of your movies were some of our favorites among the house is really this incredibly relatable, down-to-earth personality that you have in your movies from dramas like Diner to uh, thrillers, The Bedroom Window, and comedies like Three Men and a Baby. Is that, is that a way that you pr approach a lot of different characters that you play, regardless of maybe what the genre of movie is, is to just bring in a very down-to-earth, relatable point to these characters? Well, the job of an actor is to service the play. Yeah. And then you have to service the director and the character. Um, and I've always felt that you bring who you are. Yeah. You know, Robert De Niro is taken and Laurence Olivier is taken. Um, so you can only be who you are. And actors are doing the best job they can with the equipment they're given. Mm -hmm. So I bring my own unique take on the character which nobody else can bring yeah um, and um, and it is what it is you know um, if it comes off down to earth then you know that's your interpretation and that's the great part of the actor audience relationship is that everybody sees something different mm -hmm. uh, you know I have a cert I was born with certain equipment so that sort of um, impression um, is uh, is laid upon the audience and they make that interpretation. Um, so I always do believe that my, I, my job as well as servicing the play is to make it in, interpretable for the audience. So I really work on that um, and I'm always putting myself in the balcony um, to an extent and watching the play too to make sure that what I'm doing um, the audience will come away with some value so if it's uh, you know down to earth then that's great I did a, a retrospective on you recently and I went back and rewatched a lot of movies throughout your career and even a couple that I hadn't come across before, and one of them that I hadn't, and I was surprised that I, I hadn't, honestly. It was a, a, a really cool, underrated movie, one that you did in 1987, a Curtis Hansen movie called The Bedroom Window. When, when that movie came out in 1987, which was around Three Men and a Baby and a year after Short Circuit, I believe, was it really cool going into this very Hitchcockian style uh, uh, thriller that was – different genre from a couple that you had kind of done a, a, around that movie. Was that a very unique experience to be in, 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 a, in a movie like that? Well, the material was so great. Yeah. Uh, Curtis Hansen not only directed it, he wrote it. Um, and uh, just a, a brilliant talent. And the chance to work with Isabelle Huppert and Elizabeth McGovern uh, and Wally Shawn, um, you know, you um, – you get to you get, you bring your game and you always yeah. bring high game to a job. 
Um, and then whoever you're playing with um, ups your game, and uh, hopefully. And I was really fortunate to work with these people and, and be able to um, play in a, in a genre that dictates uh, an intelligent, well-thought-out, reserved kind of performance by all the characters and that's one where the audience gets to participate even more than comedies or or horror or science fiction um, they get to be a detective so uh, it was a, it was a thrill to be in a film like that and and it's uh, it's really highly regarded it's one of his best work I think no, I agree. Yeah, I was I was really really entertained by it. I thought it was a really cool this a really cool thriller. The villain was great. The cinematography was fantastic. It had a solid story in it. Like I was talking to some people afterwards, going like, "You should really really check out this thriller." Do you have a a movie of yours in your filmography that you've always felt was maybe the most uh, underrated film that you have done? No. Um, yeah. You know, I, I I look at them all really fondly. They're all, yeah. they're all great, you know. Um, and it takes as much effort to make a movie that works as it does to make one that doesn't work. Um, and are there pictures that got more views and more audience than others? Absolutely. Um, but I don't judge them. You know, they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're work. You know, sometimes you build a skyscraper in the middle of Manhattan on 57th and, you know, and, and eighth and uh, everybody sees it. And then yeah. sometimes you go out to, you know, Albany, New York, and you build a barn where the only people that are going to see it are the owners and the cows, but it's mm-hmm. a good barn. Uh, but it, it has no less value than the building on 57th and, and eighth. Oh, yeah. One of my earliest memories of watching one of your movies was Can't Stop the Music, um, the, the the Village People uh, movie. When you did that, did you did you already know uh, roller skating before then? Was that part of any kind of uh, um, audition process for that movie? Was that you in the movie throughout the in the opening scene of the movie roller skating through uh, Times Square? Yeah, it, there was a, actually a did have to take roller skating lessons um and uh alan carr the producer was such an impresario and so extraordinary to work with because he really was a smart smart producer his movies before that were saturday night fever and grease Mm -hmm. so um where and he was just such a smart smart guy um and he uh he worked for robert stigwood and he was just really a brilliant guy. Um, and that picture uh, was fascinating because it was such a big budget at that time. Um, and the amalgamation of all those strange talents all together, the village people, Nancy Walker, Valerie Perrine, Bruce Jenner, um, and um, and me, uh, and Paul Sand, uh, June Havoc. There were some really cool people in that movie, um, and uh, it was a, you know, it, it you know, it didn't work. It, it ultimately, you know, is a, a big explosion of Peter Max paint on a canvas. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't a Miro; it was a Peter Max. Yeah. But um, and it just, it just it missed the audience. But you know, it's another one that you do your best job. You go in. And you know when the camera rolls, you know on a any film you're 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 working your ass off trying to make a trying to make an impression. One movie that it, this really really holds up even when I watched it again here recently was the 1983 made for TV movie The Day After. Um, Great movie. Yeah. Oh man, that still is just a disturbing movie to this day. Like it it wildly holds up. Like just as much watching it again a couple of months ago as it did when I saw it for the first time when I was a kid. What was really the vibe on set? Did you know that the um, the movie like that would go on to have the impact that it did not only at the time, but even 
the lasting power that it that it has to still remain a, a very disturbing movie to this day. Yeah, it, it was the highest rated television event, uh, I think, of all time uh, mm-hmm. when it came out, and it was uh, it was a serious movie to make. We all knew that we were making something important because something like that had never been done. Nick Meyer was a really smart, cagey filmmaker. Uh, he wrote it. He was really politically involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, John Lithgow, and Jason Robards. I mean, you know, it was a really incredible cast. Um, and uh, it wasn't, we knew, we knew it was a really important film. Um, because ABC was going to put it on and make a big deal. Mm-hmm. They actually made a really big deal about it when they um, uh, they put on, I think um, I think it was um, Secretary McNamara was on it. Hey, damn it. And um, uh, afterward, to sort of calm the nation down after they saw yeah. it. Uh, it was a great, great fl- film to be part of. It really was. Oh, yeah. And it was a uh, big night for television, too, between the day after and the power that it had. And it was like, uh, I want to say it was the series finale of Alice was also going on around uh, the time as well. Um, right. I, I really love uh, the movie. I, I love a lot of the early 80s uh, 3D movies when there was that big kind of brief resurgence in the early 80s, where like coming at you Friday the 13th Part 3. And you were in one of them, this movie called The Man Who Wasn't There. What what was that like doing uh, a, a 3D movie like that at, at, at that time? That picture was fascinating because Frank Lancuso Jr., whose father was the president of Paramount, Frank yeah. Lancuso, uh, did all the Friday the 13th. So he was very successful. And he was able to sort of write a check carte blanche. And he wanted to do a 3D movie. Um, Bruce Malmuth, um just did a picture before with uh, Stallone called Black Hawk, I think. Yeah. So he was he was a really good filmmaker. Came from some serious neighborhood playhouse, Sandy Meisner um, acting school. So he was really serious, and I really enjoyed working with him. They the the fascinating part was the technical. They had two cameras with two lenses, and that's how that particular 3D was done. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was one of the first 3D movies, sort of in the in the next sort of phase of of technical advancement. Um, and uh, I had a great time. Lisa Langlois was the female lead. She was really great, um, and uh, the cast was terrific. I think Jeffrey Tambor was in it. I think. Yes, he was. Yeah, he was. Yeah, Jeffrey was in it. Jeffrey was such a funny guy to work with um and uh it was it was a really interesting experience i caught a young william forsyth in there too that's right bill forsyth was in it that's right yeah what a great guy what a great guy he is i've uh, done a couple of conventions with him before and yeah totally like when uh one that i would watch with my dad a lot when i was younger was uh diner there's one great thing that comes across in that movie, which is these bond that all of these characters have in the movie from all of the, the plots going on with Mickey Rourke and Ellen Barkin to uh, your character and your character's fiance as well. And was that very much what the vibe was like on set too? Did you guys all really get to know each other as friends? Uh, you, Paul Reiser, Tim Daly, all these guys. And did you get to know each other a lot before the movie? Is that part of how this, uh, this chemistry works so well on screen. Barry Levinson is very, very smart, smart, clever, and talented writer, director, one of the best in the world. So he knew to bring everybody in about a week earlier, which he did. Mm-hmm. And we, um, we all were in the Holiday Inn in Baltimore, and we went out to dinner every night, and we spent time together every day. We went to the, the aquarium together. We went to the seaport together, and uh, we really got to know each other really well. Mickey and I got particularly close. We would go out to uh, nightclubs together. And, and then, you know, I got close with Paul Reiser and Kevin and Danny and Danny's wife, Laura. And, you know, it, it was uh, it was a great group. And, and, of course, you know, Timmy Daly, um, 
and then, you know, we had a great producer and uh, Mark Johnson. So who later on won the Academy Award for Beautiful Mind, I think. No, he won the Academy Award for something. Oh, for Rain Man. Um, and it was a great experience. And also Barry is a very savvy director and he knew that he had six and Ellen Barkin, of course, and he had six really, really hungry actors there who were talented. So he, he would let us improv a little bit and, uh, and then some good stuff came out of it. Do you know as much about football in real life as your character from the movie? <laughs> I don't. You know, I, I like to watch it. My brother-in-law, Dan Lynch, is the vice president of the New York football giants. Mm-hmm. And um, some friends of ours, uh, the Tisch family, own the giants. But uh, I don't know much about it other than watching it and enjoying it. I'm, 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 a, I'm not really a sports fan other than I like to watch the entertainment of it. I, I'm not one of those guys who know all the stats. But. Oh, same. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, same here. I know what you'd be like. We have like a we have a Super Bowl party every year for you know the spectacle of it and everything. But that's <laughs> pretty much usually my. I usually don't even know who's playing in the Super Bowl until I actually get yeah. to the party. It is the the 35th anniversary of Police Academy. It feels like just yesterday to me that I was seeing these movies in the theater with the. Uh, with my parents and, you know, my mom taking me to them and everything. What do you feel is really the, uh, is the lasting power of this movie, of this franchise to the point to where there's even been, I've, I've seen you talk about it online before about how there's even been talks of even a, a, another police Academy movie or more I- adventures of Mahoney. How do you feel that this movie has been good enough and and funny too to really be, remain popular among all these generations since it came out. You know, I just got to say it really has to do with the writers Neil Israel, Pat Proft, then the director Hugh Wilson, and the producer Paul Maslansky, mm-hmm. um, and uh, an extraordinarily talented cast, and um, and it really had two things. It was. It was technically and creatively funny. Yeah. That's, diffi- that's difficult. And it had an incredible amount of goodwill. And audiences want that. They want goodwill. So whenever it's on television now or cable, it gets seen because people love that part of life, you know, uh, misfits, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, succeeding. People adore that because we're all, to an extent, misfits. Well, I wanted to say thank you for all of the movies that you've done, the, the, the years of entertainment that you personally, I mean, given to me, my family. I There's a reason that I grew up watching a lot of your movies, which is, one, I mean, just how entertaining they are. And also, like, it is – it is you. It's your likability. It is how funny you are in these movies and how really genuine all of these performances are. And, you know, there's a reason why uh, for, my, for an anniversary episode of my show, I wanted to spotlight your work. And that is to say thank you so much for all the years of entertainment that you've given to not only myself, but to audiences as well. And these movies real from short circuit to diner to the day after to three men and a baby. They all hold up today, just as much today as they did then. And uh, it's been really cool seeing you on the Goldbergs as well. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Man. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank of you. course. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure, man. Have a great day. And uh, thanks for the interview. You too. You too. Have a great week.